And the next item of business is to make debate on motion 11802 in the name of Jean Freeman on stage three of the Social Security Scotland Bill. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. Now we do have a little time in hand because the amendments finished earlier than was expected. So um, I can be a little generous uh, with the speaking times as long as no one goes over the top and um, plenty of space for interventions too. And I call on Jean Freeman to speak to and move the motion around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is a historic day for this Parliament. When we vote on the Social Security Scotland Bill, we will be marking the single biggest transfer of powers since devolution began. It will herald the first social security system in Scotland. But more than that, it means we now have a new public service for the people of Scotland, a principle now enshrined in legislation. And that, I believe, is something we should all be proud of. Presiding officer, this bill has been an opportunity to set up a new service and to do things differently, to remake the system in a way that better fits with the ambition we have for ourselves as a parliament and for our country, our shared ambition to live with dignity, fairness and respect. I would like to thank the many Scottish Government officials who have worked tirelessly on this bill and to set up our new agency, Social Security Scotland. In particular, I must thank the bill team who have been outstanding in their commitment and their dedication. Let me also express my thanks to the clerks and to the conveners, both conveners of the Social Security Committee, Sandra White, who steered it in its early days, and Claire Adamson through the latter part, particularly through stage two, and members, of course, of the Social Security Committee. I want to thank them for the spirit in which they have taken part in our collective work on the bill and for rising to the challenge to do things differently and to do them better. I thank them for their amendments, their views, and their considered deliberation and engagement with me throughout. I also want to thank the many, many organisations I have met with and listened to. They have helped to shape this bill enormously, and I am grateful to them for their input at every point. But most of all, I want to thank the people of Scotland who have been at the forefront of this bill at all times. From the start of our engagement programme in 2016, I have been thankful and humbled that people felt able to open up and tell me about their personal experience of the DWP and the current UK welfare system. Not an easy thing for anyone to do, when especially when talking about a system which recently has not served them well. For the first time ever, this government, a government, has recruited people to help them shape the service and the system that they are establishing. We were and remain determined to make sure that our new public service works in the interests of the public. More than 2,400 people have agreed to be part of our experience panels and we're working with them closely on each stage of the process. And I want to thank them for their help and their support so far and for the work we will continue to do with them throughout the lifetime of this parliament. Our system will be rights-based, recognising that social security is itself a human right with a set of founding principles at its heart and the central requirement that the system should treat everyone with the dignity and the respect they deserve. That is why, as just one example, we have introduced a right to have a supporter with you at every stage of the process and a right to access independent advocacy for anyone who, because of a disability, needs that support to engage fully and effectively with the system. That rights-based approach is one that Parliament, I believe, should be proud of. Let me quote Inclusion Scotland from an evidence session with the Social Security Committee when they said, we consider the greatest strength to be some of the principles in the bill and that people who use the system will be treated with dignity and respect. Those are important rights that disabled people have sought for many years. The principles that now underpin the bill are an important signal of how social security will be delivered. The greatest quality of the bill is that human rights-based approach. That is why when it comes to disability benefits, for example, we are committed to making the right decisions from the outset. 
the onus will be on Social Security Scotland to get the information needed to make decisions. Doing that means we can reduce the need for one-to-one -one assessments, significantly reduce the anxiety and distress caused by these unnecessary assessments, a move described by Citizens as Vice Scotland as the highest priority for the social security system in Scotland. And we will not require anyone to undertake an assessment delivered by the private sector. Improvements such as our new short-term assistance will ensure that the fear of losing benefit payments won't act as a barrier to pursuing your right to challenge the decisions that affect you, a significant improvement on the current system. And if people disagree with our decisions, rather than making things more difficult, we will help them to make an appeal. We will work with you to make sure that the process is as simple and straightforward as possible, but that you remain in control, deciding what you want to do about your situation. Thanks to this bill, we will make sure that all our agency staff communicate with people in an accessible way. An improvement the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists recognises is the first time inclusive communication has appeared in any legislation anywhere in the United Kingdom. Members have made decisions on some very important and sometimes very difficult issues. And I think that this bill in its final form, which we have arrived at by working together, not just today, but right through the bill process, is the stronger and the better for it. Presiding officer, I have spoken before about how the devolution of social security represents the greatest single increase in the responsibilities of this parliament since devolution. Today, we write a new chapter in our history, a system built for the people of Scotland, designed in partnership with the people of Scotland, a system with dignity, fairness, and respect at its heart, a system, and I quote, quite unlike any other that has gone before. I am proud and I am honored to move the motion in my name. I now call Adam Tompkins. Around six minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and if I may say so, well said, Minister. Um, this is, as the Minister said, another one of those um, very important days in the coming of age of our Parliament. As the Minister said, it is indeed historic. What we are doing today, presiding, Deputy Presiding Officer, is delivering <laughs> on the welfare devolution that was legislated for um, after the all-party agreement in the Smith Commission by a Conservative government uh, at Westminster in the Scotland Act 2016. And the devolution, devolution is something which I have throughout my entire life enthusiastically supported. Um, and uh, devolution of social security is something which I have worked with others to try and deliver for a number of years. It will allow us to experiment, um, to try something new. It will allow us to learn from others' experience and to build um, on experience, including failed experience elsewhere, and it will allow us where we can to lead by example. And this bill delivers, I think, on all of those uh, ambitions, or at least it promises to, depending on what happens next. Uh, devolution in social security or in welfare also brings with it significant challenges, and those challenges should not be um, underestimated. The biggest single challenge, I think, uh, is how we navigate our way through the inevitable um, labyrinth uh, of shared rule um, between the Scottish ministers on the one hand and the DWP on the other hand. Uh, this is a, the, this, that's the wrong metaphor to use because I need more hands than two. Um, there is, in fact, shared rule not only between the Scottish Government and the DWP, but also with local authorities and indeed with the third sector. And figuring out how we... The, the biggest single challenge that we were presented with um, in the Smith Commission when we were thinking about social security was whatever you do, don't make it more complicated. Devolution inevitably makes it more complicated. Social security in Scotland has never been so complicated as it is now, and it will only get more complex. And the challenge that we have as lawmakers um, uh, and the challenge that ministers have um, as uh, people charged with the responsibility of executing the law that this place makes it is to ensure that that complication, that that complexity does not become a burden to the people in our society who rely uh, on the, law, the laws and the regulations that we, that we make. This is a bill, presiding officer, that we will enthusiastically support at decision time tonight, as we have throughout 
um, its parliamentary process. And like the Minister, I would like, if I may, to say a few uh, thank yous. First of all, to uh, the Social Security Committee, on which I have the privilege to serve, and in particular its still relatively new convener, Claire Adamson, um, and our clerks, um, notably uh, Simon, who is about to retire from the Parliament after long service. And I'd like personally to thank Simon and his clerking team for all of the work that they have done uh, in steering us through what was not a straightforward piece of uh, legislative work. I'd like to thank my Scottish Conservative colleagues in the Social Security and Welfare and Social Justice team, especially my good friend Jeremy Balfour, whose pioneering work, particularly on terminal illness and other aspects of this bill, has been inspirational, if I may say so, Jeremy, and it's a real honour to work alongside you uh, in this uh, field. And I'd also, so long as it isn't going to damage her political career too much, like to thank the Minister, uh, Jean Freeman, and indeed her officials and special advisor, um, uh, Jeanette Campbell, for the constructive and mature approach that she and they have taken to the passage of this legislation and indeed for her generous comments uh, earlier on this evening. The Parliament, I think, presiding officer, has worked well through the process of the, the legislative um, passage of this bill to improve this bill. I want to give three examples of areas where I think the bill is stronger now than it was when it was introduced last year. The first example is with regard to the social security principles. And we all agree um, on the importance of a principles based approach to social security, um, but turning that political <coughs> ambition uh, into statute law did may, uh, run some risks of unnecessary litigation as the bill was first drafted. And we fixed all that and, we, and we've tidied it up. And I think those provisions of the bill are much stronger now than they were a few months ago. Likewise, I think uh, it's fair to say that we all support the idea of the social security charter. But again, writing that policy into law generated unanticipated complications, which were first identified and then resolved uh, uh, through the process of parliamentary scrutiny, making the bill stronger as a result. More importantly, presiding officer, the bill, as introduced, conferred exceptionally broad rulemaking and regulation-making powers on ministers, with no provision um, for external or uh, expert scrutiny, and with only minimal and plainly unsatisfactory provision for effective parliamentary scrutiny. And thanks to the detailed work uh, on this, undertaken at stage two by the Social Security Committee and by the Delegated Powers Committee, this area of the bill has now been substantially amended, including earlier on this afternoon, and improved. And the Minister, I think, deserves credit, if I can say so, for engaging constructively with the Parliament's committees and indeed with opposition MSPs uh, on this critical matter. But notwithstanding the fact that the bill is significantly improved um, on the bill that was uh, published upon introduction a few months ago, it remains the case that much of this bill, important though it is, continues to be only a framework bill. I don't mean only in any derogatory sense at all. The critical questions in Social Security are who is entitled to what? And this bill answers neither of those questions. All the rules about eligibility criteria and about fixing the amounts of benefit to be paid will be provided for in regulations to be made by ministers. And these are matters which are not addressed in the bill at all. The bill sets the framework through which these regulations will be made. It feels like we have achieved something today in passing this bill, but there is an awful lot of work to do uh, before devolved so um, Scottish Social Security is actually in operation. And there will be a lot of very detailed and painstaking parliamentary work and legislative work to do. So looking forward in my closing remarks, uh, presiding officer, what next? Well, I hope that we will turn away from framework questions, from process questions, from procedural questions to the substantive questions of who is going to be entitled to what. And as we do that, um, we on these benches have three concerns that we would ask the minister to bear in mind as we go forward in the delivery um, between now and the end of this parliamentary session of devolved social security. The first is a concern around the pace of transfer. Are we, move, are we transferring powers from Westminster to Holyrood as expeditiously as possible, or it, are there hints uh, of delay? The second concern which perhaps relates to this is, a, is, is an ongoing concern, actually a deepening concern that I have about the transparency of the intergovernmental process. We know that there are um, uh, probably irregular, but nonetheless frequent meetings of the Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare. 
We know that we as members of the Scottish Parliament are entitled to see the agendas of those meetings before they take place and the minutes of those meetings as soon as possible after they take place. And I'm not sure that that always happens. The more transparent ministers can be about the conversations they have at official or ministerial level with colleagues in the DWP and elsewhere in Whitehall, the better able we as MSPs will be able to do our job of helping ministers to deliver uh, these powers as, ex as expeditiously as possible. And the third concern going forward, uh, presiding officer, is of course cost. And these are concerns which the Auditor General has recently brought to the attention of the Parliament through uh, her uh, recently published uh, report on the implementation of the Scotland Act 2016. I don't want to dwell on those as uh, negatives. I think that they are all challenges which we share right across the political spectrum, whether we are in government uh, or in opposition. There is an awful lot of work to do to deliver devolved social security properly in Scotland, but today marks a very important step along the way. Thank you. I call Mark Griffin, uh, a generous five minutes. Thank you, President Officer. I want to th thank the, the parliamentary clerks, um, my committee colleagues, the, the minister, the minister's officials, and the third sector and civic society for getting this important piece of legislation to where it is today. Um, I think it's fair to say that when it was lodged, the bill didn't quite live up to the hype. Um, and if it wasn't for the support from across the third sector who have the real expertise mm -hmm. in social mm -hmm. security, we might have been in a very different position. But almost 350 amendments later, a good debate at stages one, two, and the amendment stage at stage three, I'm proud to say that I think the, the bill is stronger than it was when it was introduced last summer. At stage one, I reminded the chamber that we only get one first go at this. And today, I hope the Chamber will consider whether we've got it right for the 1.4 million people who will come to rely on the system. The young mum worried about her child being born into poverty. The disabled person with hundreds of pounds of additional monthly costs. And the pensioner worried about the heating bill. Now, on banning the private sector, protecting against means testing, and securing a new right to advocacy on social security, I'm delighted that um, our Labour colleagues and indeed colleagues from across the chamber um, in government and in opposition have led the way. Um, again, at stage three, we on these benches have secured a, a commitment to work towards automatic split payments, protected carers from the benefits freeze, secured the automation of benefits and ensured assessments are conducted by suitably qualified persons. Um, all of these might seem like small changes, but they are hugely significant and should improve the new system. We do still have our differences. We still want to see child benefit topped up and we'll soon look again at how we truly embed human rights into the system when the First Minister's advisory group reports. And together with my colleagues, Paula McNeill and Jackie Bailey, we've tried today to push the government further on offences, redetermination and overpayments. And that's something I think we will all keep a, a watching brief on. We, we again should ask ourselves if this is landmark legislation. I think given the circumstances which led to the devolution of these powers, the referendum, the vow, Smith and Third Scotland Act, it should be. And though we've put the powers on the statute books. It's for the people who experience the system to decide whether we have put those powers to good use. The presiding officer, given recent news stories about delays to the abolition of the bedroom tax, ministers asking for an extra year and the DWP readying itself to step in, it's quite clear that this is very much the beginning of a process full of questions. Last week's um, change on the definition of terminal illness will very welcome, as I said in the stage three amendment debate, should make us a, a bit uneasy. Um, we, we appreciate the First Minister's pledge to listen and the, the, the Minister's uh, action, and that victory is well deserved for campaigners and those who are terminally ill, but that experience can't be a template for how ministers are going to set up the system and with swathes of regulation still to come, including intricate policy design of nine forms of assistance, the government has to be sure they're ready for 
that challenge ahead. The two areas we made early progress on were agreement to use a super affirmative procedure married with a new independent commission. They're both included in our response to the bill ahead of stage one. And while that scrutiny process may seem burdensome, I think it's clearly uh, vital. Um, uh, alongside that scrutiny, last week showed Parliament, um, last week Parliament showed the government that they should be far more transparent in its policy design, its listening, and how it, it works across the chamber. First sight of the government's initial amendment came on Tuesday evening, a few hours ahead of the, the final amendment de um, deadline. And for something so fundamental to disability benefits, we'd obviously much rather that key detail be published further um, in advance and look to, to that example going forward. Uh, President Officer, the, the overriding message from stage three is that we as a parliament have much more work to do so that the people of Scotland can be proud of its new social security system. And that work here will get vital support to disabled people, when to fuel payments to our elderly, and in time truly overhaul carers' allowance. And that's both the responsibility of government um, and parliament. Like we've done on tax and on this bill, we look forward to ensuring that we have a functioning social security system which invests in the people of Scotland, and we are ready for that challenge ahead. Thank you. I call Alison Johnson. Around four minutes, please. Um, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I too would like to begin by thanking um, Simon Watkins and his clerking team, um, the witnesses who, who took time to give us their, their expert advice, um, and the many organisations that we've worked together with throughout this whole process. There are too many to name, but I'm truly thankful um, to them all. And I think it's fair to say that it is fair to say that MSPs from every party on the committee have made the most sincere efforts to strengthen this bill. Labour, SNP and Conservative MSPs have improved the bill significantly with their amendments. At times we've discussed very difficult issues on which we fundamentally agreed, but I think we have done that always with civility and I thank them for that. I would also like to thank Jean Freeman. Setting up a new social security system is quite possibly the biggest ever challenge that has faced a Scottish minister since 1999. And I believe the first minister chose wisely in selecting Jean Freeman for that task. She's undertaken it with passion, dedication, and when required, good humor. Um, so, I think the promise of devolution is that Scotland should have the powers to do things differently. And sometimes that can be taking existing UK policies and improving them with the knowledge and experience that we have here. And at other moments or on other issues, it's a more fundamental change. And I think social security is such an issue. And right now is such a moment because for too many people, the current system is fostering insecurity. We only have to look at the Trussell Trust figures that have been announced this week. Um, in 2017-18, it issued 170,000 three-day emergency food parcels here in Scotland, and 55,000 of those were to children. We appear to be losing the idea that society is strengthened when everyone is enabled to live a decent life. And that's how we've got to the situation where disabled people have their benefits cut to bridge the deficit. So I think we have the opportunity to reclaim the idea that when we provide a good, reliable income for the most vulnerable people in society, everyone benefits. And the question before us today is, does the bill allow us to do that? Well, on the whole, I believe the bill has progressed towards that and Greens will support it at decision time. Dignity and respect are absolutely at the heart of the bill. The problem with the current system isn't just that support has been cut, though that is quite bad enough. The culture around the current system is hugely problematic. A culture of suspicion of people who ask for help from the benefits system. And when those attitudes prevail at the top, they filter down and distort the entire system. So if we set up a new system that is from the outset founded on the idea that social security is a right and that we all expect to be treated with dignity and respect when applying for help, it will give rise to a quite different, more empowering, more, more positive system. I'm, I'm pleased that with Having begun with no provision on this at all, there's now a statutory mechanism for uprating four of the forms of assistance. Um, but I will continue to push for automatic rate uprating to apply to all benefits. Um, and I'll urge the government to continue to look at that. 
Um, and of course, as colleagues have said, in passing the bill today, we've yet to help a single applicant or recipient. So we have got much work um, yet to do. The new forms of assistance will be established in secondary legislation for each and every new regulation. We will need to debate, discuss, highlight issues and ask the government to think again, just as we have for this bill. Um, you know, I think we see progress on some issues. Topping up carers' allowances a welcome start, but there's a whole range of unfairnesses in the current allowance that Scottish ministers should examine and then eradicate. Um, disability assistance represents around half of the value of all the payments being devolved. Um, the abolition of DLA and the introduction of PIP have been singularly disastrous. 44% of DLA claimants have either lost their entitlement entirely or have had it significantly reduced. And that rises to over 50% for some mental health conditions. Constituents are being driven to the depths of despair by the current PIP system. And so, quite rightly, expectations for the new disability assistance payments will be very high indeed. This will be a great test of the Scottish Government's resolve and um, presiding officer, I'm conscious of time. Too many Scots have been pushed to breaking point and some sadly beyond it by the current system. Now this bill, if passed, will set rightly very high expectations of a more humane, a more generous, a more respectful system of providing financial help to those who require it. It's central to the credibility of this parliament that we meet that challenge and Greens look forward to playing a role in that in the coming years. Thank you. Alex Paul Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by reminding uh, members of my register of interest that I jointly own a property which we rent out to uh, uh, tenants who receive the direct payment of housing benefit. Now, can I start by lending my voice to the almost universal acclaim to the work of Jean Freeman, uh, her ministerial team and her special advisors. I think uh, she has conducted her dealings with me with great tolerance, given that uh, not being represented on the committee, um, I wasn't always cited on many of the issues that I was often uh, told to lobby her about. Uh, she gave me uh, great consideration, she gave freely of her time, and actually sought out my counsel uh, when developments were moving very quickly and always sought to include me in that. So I'm uh, very, very grateful for her forbearance in that and for the consensus sh that she fostered. Where I referenced in the debate the agreement reached around the definition of terminal uh, in, uh, illness and I think I actually used the hashtag rabbit out of the hat because I think she squared a circle nobody else fully expected her to do and I think she did so uh, to great effect. Now, in the stage one proceedings of this bill, I lent on the words of a liberal who helped to preside over the creation of the modern social security system in these islands as we know them. William Beveridge said, in establishing a national minimum, we should leave room and encouragement for each individual to provide more than the minimum for themselves and their family. That is the central tenant of social mobility around which he sought to build the UK social security system. And I'm gratified to see that very much at large in uh, the Scottish social security system that we will today launch. That is the first pillar. The second pillar has to be accessibility. And we've heard a lot about that today. And I think it, um, it is very significant that this government recognizes and puts front and center the very real problem that 500,000 families in this country do not currently receive the full uptake of benefits that they could be entitled to. And so I think it's great that the amendments we've passed today will see this uh, system and the process for uh, applicants far easier than uh, counterparts in Westminster, but not just a uh, process of application, process of appeal as well. And I think we've been happy to support those amendments today and in the passage of this bill, which will make it easier for people who, through no fault of their own, have been found against um, who should not have been. And I think it's also important to reflect the many representations we've all had from organizations who provide and deliver independent advocacy, particularly in the benefits landscape. The benefit landscape can be a terribly confusing place and one that's often filled with stigma as well. And independent advocates, like lend that navigation, that communication and articulation for people who might otherwise struggle uh, to speak for themselves. And then for me, and I'm sure for everybody else in this chamber, the, the final key principle of this system has to be its humanity. I think it's fair to say that we have seen the 
disruption of that humanity in, in systems in, in the rest of the UK. And I think we are restoring some of that humanity today, whether that's in the way we conduct assessments for people that is not fostered around an atmosphere of suspicion and, and puts them very much in the driving seat around that. In the things like the overpayment recovery, uh, the most important, one of the most important amendments we passed today for, for myself and many others is, is the splitting of payments and, and the fact that we will hopefully drive the DWP further to that end to end coercive control and abusive relationships but also and I think I referenced this earlier that hugely important recognition of the difficulty faced by those people who receive that awful diagnosis that they only have just weeks if not months uh, to live left on this planet and we have today I think recognised that it's important there be no impediment to the state's protection of them and their family so that they can conduct their affairs and, and quit this life in the knowledge that they will be supported. It's a fantastic start and I think it's a, it's a really important day for our, our history as a country and as a devolved nation. I want to um, remind the minister that will be working closely with her so that and I won't accept the excuse that we shouldn't just clean up Westminster's messes that there are things that we have the power now to do in terms of introducing new, new benefits particularly around the erosion of uh, benefits to young widows and, and uh, the waspy women but today is a day for consensus so let me finish on the note that I started with and thank the minister her team and indeed the committee which I wish I sometimes was a member of um, but I, I commend this bill to the parliament and assure them of the Liberal Democrats support for it tonight. Thank you. We now move to the open debate and speeches of four minutes, but I do have a, a little bit of time in hand so I can be generous. And I call Claire Adamson to be followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Um, Presiding officer, I'm delighted to speak in this historic debate in the Scottish Parliament. It brings into statute the most significant transfers of, of powers following the Smith Commission and since devolution. This bill will see the de devolution of £2.9 billion of social security <sighs> benefits to Scotland. It transfers 11 benefits and will impact 1.4 million of our citizens in Scotland. I'm not speaking today as convener of the Social Security Committee, but I also would like to thank those who between June and October last year took the time to share their experience and views with the committee we received 119 written submissions from individuals, charities, councils, universities, advice services, volunteering networks and professional bodies. I too would like to thank the clerking team for, for the Social Security Committee and it, uh, particularly Simon Watkins, not only for his help in the stewardship of this bill, but for his service to this parliament since 1999. And of course, I would like to thank my colleagues on the committee for their diligence, their engagement, which has been well rehearsed by other members this afternoon. I'd like to talk about the aspects of the bill that underline the ethos and approach that will underpin the Scottish social security system, an approach which is markedly different from what we have at the moment, and one evidenced by the Scottish Social Security Charter. For the first time, we have a rights-based approach and continuing Scotland's long-standing tradition of support of human rights, we have enshrined this in the principles of the new system and in this legislation. And the charter within the bill strengthens our guarantee of going beyond warm words, but creating a binding contract between the government and its citizens who will be supported by the Scottish social security system. And as the minister said in, in the deliberations this afternoon, increases the accountability of this parliament to its citizens. Earlier, Mr. Balfour said that the committee and the minister had been on a journey uh, in one particular area. I would say the whole thing has been a journey for us on the Social Security Committee and those involved in the bill. Um, we've had obstacles on the way, sometimes molehills, sometimes mountains. We've not often taken the same path, some of us in the high road and some of us on the low road. But I do believe that we have all arrived together at a destination and one that we should all rightly be very proud of. I believe the strength of this bill is testament to the Parliament. Mr Adam mentioned maturity earlier on and I, I would go further than that. The maturity, the cons consultation, the collaboration that has been mentioned by many members have all brought us here today. 
I'm struck by how often the consultation and the willing of ministers to work with members and also the third sector and interested organisations have been mentioned in the chamber today, not least of which was the work of the social security expert system mentioned by Ms Johnson earlier on. But during the debate, Alex Cold Hamilton mentioned brutal application of the rules. And I think it's fair to say that a lot of the challenges we have, have experienced has been because of that, because of brutal application of the rules and that people whose experience has to, to date of, a, a, of the DWP system has been one of punitive um, application of rules and, and not a positive one. Um, the current system is broken. A failure rate where over 50% of tribunals uh, uh, have the decisions overturned is broken and as we move forward I look um, with interest to the Work and Pensions Committee in Westminster who are now doing an inquiry into the benefits system which I think will enlighten this area even further but I am confident that this bill will change the experience of our citizens it will be conducted in a way that is not punitive bureaucratic it will be done with dignity fairness and respect and I welcome it and I hope it will be a beacon to other legislators as to how our citizens should be respected and how their rights should be enforced. Thank you. I call Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today, as people have said before me, we have taken a historic step in creating a Scottish welfare system that is accountable to and tailored for the Scottish people. And as Ad Adam Tompkins has already in intimated, this bill is enthusiastically supported this evening on these benches. Through the mechanisms of devolution and in line with the proposals set out in the Smith Commission, the UK government have transferred legislative competence over 11 social security benefits, as well as the right to top up benefits reserved to the UK Parliament and some rights to create new benefits, enhancing not only the power of this Parliament, but also its responsibilities. The bill sets out seven principles for Scottish Social Security, but perhaps the most important of, of that, of which is that respect for the dignity of individuals is to be at the heart of Scottish Social Security. Colleagues across this chamber have worked hard to ensure that legislation de this legislation delivers that respect. And whilst there were some disagreements for such a complex and challenging legislative area, its progress has been characterised by mature and thoughtful debate at every stage. During today's debate, it was acknowledged that the most difficult aspect of this bill was delivering a system that delivers fair and dignified benefits for those who are facing life-limiting illnesses. I would like to thank my colleague Jeremy Balfour, who brought forward amendments in this area and has worked hard to secure a fairer deal for the terminally ill, and also to pay tribute to the advice and support of MND and Marie Curie that has guided us through this complex issue. I am delighted that the, the Minister came forward last week with an amendment that could be unanimously supported. And I hope that it will, it will provide flexibility and a person-centred approach to benefits for those who are facing terminal illness. However, despite the smooth progress of the bill as a whole, I do still hold some reservation about some aspects of implementation. We have created the framework but as my colleague Adam Tompkins made clear, the detail will now be with the ministers to sort out. And I also take note of the Auditor General's recent report on the implementation of the Scotland Acts, which makes clear that much like the expansion to 1140 hours of free childcare, there is still much work to be done if Scotland is to have a successful social, social security system that delivers on time and within budget. Worryingly, the Auditor General's report states, the Scottish Government has not estimated the total cost of implementation or the extent to which this will exceed the UK Government's agreed contribution, with the excess requiring funder from the wider Scottish budget. Although I understand that the Scottish Government is developing a five-year financial plan to examine this issue, I agree with the Auditor General's opinion that more detailed estimate of costs are required as the social security system develops particularly in relation to IT systems, service develop, delivery and recruitment. In conclusion, presiding officer, under the Smith Commission, further tax raising powers have been devolved to Scotland and the Scottish Government should ensure that the costs of this programme are kept within our means, 
both for the benefit of taxpayers and to ensure that our other public services maintain their current, level, current levels of funding in keeping with the principles of this bill. In the spirit of this principle, I ask the Scottish Government to take heed of the Auditor General's recommendations to provide greater transparency and to implement as soon as possible the proposed fiscal responsibility sorry, fiscal policies of the Director General Scottish Exchequer to ensure that costs do not spiral. That said, this has been a, a historic day and a day I think we can all be proud of. Thank you. Pauline McNeill, followed by George Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's been an emotional journey, I think, for everyone involved in the creation of Scotland's very first a new social security system. We've all learned so much and I know there's been an incredible amount of hard work involved. Creating a system that has dignity and respect at the heart of it is easier said than done. But that's what we all want to achieve. And after months of hard work, scrutiny, the stages of the bill, we are certainly a lot closer than we were. I would also like to put on record my thanks to the clerks, all of the witnesses, third sector organisations, the legal team, who I have to say have been absolutely brilliant when you phone them and say, I'd like to do this, an amendment appears by magic, and I know there's an awful lot of hard work behind that. I'd like to also put on record my thanks to Jeanette Campbell, Chris Borland, and all the other officials who I know have been up, I think, in the many small hours of many mornings. Um, I'm guessing that Jeanette probably hasn't slept very much in the last few days at all by the amount of emails that I have had and I know that she's emailing everyone. But also, like others have said, I'd also like to put on record um, my thanks to Jean Freeman for the way that she's worked with us all in this bill. I think she should be personally proud of getting to this stage. And I was very pleased to work with Jean Freeman on this issue of uptake and the automation of benefits, because I know she shares my view on this. Um, and also, I hope we will return to some of the outstanding issues in relation to the tribunal system itself. But it's also worth thanking all those in the Smith Commission and round about that who argue for more powers to be devolved to this parliament. I think they've done society a great service in doing that. I think it was Alison Johnson that said that this act probably is the most important statute that we have done this session. It, we didn't get everything that we would have liked, but there's a lot that I do like. I, Daniel Blake, a very powerful movie account of one man's experience of trying to claim benefits after years of working hard for a living, brought many people to tears, but unfortunately that experience is a real one. So it's clear that we had a system that needed overhauled and a more humane and responsive system. We're very fortunate in many ways that we've had the opportunity to design a new system for Scotland, and its opening cannot come soon enough. The process has been very much a living one, as I've said. Every day there's something new in your inbox from Jeanette or from the minister. Um, I have to say it's been a bit of a nightmare trying to search for anything, because all we get is hundreds and hundreds of um, uh, headings on Social Security. But a fact is that we have a, right a rights-based, human rights approach to social security. And I do think that is in tune with the devolved settlement for the people that we seek to help and empower. For the poorest, the most vulnerable and the most in need. People who have lived a full and active life, who for one reason or another find themselves jobless in a period of economic uncertainty, or they are disabled by an illness or accident. If I learn anything from, this, anything from this process is that any one of us uh, and wider society could fall upon this misfortune. So acquiring help and assistance for a social security system is vital. So much progress has been made in so many areas, but payments, terminal illness and advocacy. And I'm particularly pleased to have contributed to the section of the bill ensuring the uptake of benefits, placing a duty on ministers to, to assist those who apply for benefits to get their entitlement to other benefits without having to complete another forum. In conclusion, presiding officer, it is accepted, it was Adam Tompkins that made the point that it's only a framework for the details still to come down the line by the former regulation. 
The Social Security Committee, I believe, has to establish a high standard of scrutiny in the years ahead because of that. It will be a test of the parliamentary system. It will be a test to individual politicians as to whether we are up for the job and for the powers that we have been given. The super affirmative procedure is welcome, but it needs close attention to make sure that it actually works. And the committee must show that it can take charge of the detail and continue to work with ministers and the new Social Security Commission. There's a lot that can be done to tackle poverty by the Social Security Agency. I think it's worth a special mention. We have so much more to do, but I've been privileged to be part of this process, presiding officer, and I want to thank all those who've been involved in getting there. Thank you. Now moving to the, the last of the open debate contributions, but it is an, an important occasion. So if anyone would like to contribute for a minute or two, um, please just press your request to speak button while Mr. Adam is making his contribution. Hey, officer, I hope you're not doing that to try and cut my time that you promised me earlier <laughs> on. Uh, but uh, thank you, presiding officer. Firstly, can I add uh, my thanks to Jean Freeman and the Minister Jean Freeman and her team because they've been absolutely excellent through this whole process. As a humble backbencher, I've been able to go in at any time and uh, discuss any of the issues that I've had with uh, the, the whole bill. And one of the things I think we need to, when we're talking about how we go about things in the future and how we move forward, we need to look at is, look at how we got to where we are today. Look at how we actually managed to work together to ensure that we got a bill that was uh, fit for purpose moving forward. And I'd also say, you know, this last week we were in a position where with terminal illness that we didn't think we were going to get agreement and we managed to get stick together and managed to get something that actually is better than what the groups themselves actually want. But as everyone else has already said, presiding officer, this is a historic debate. And it gives us as parliamentarians the opportunity to stand up for the people of Scotland in the way that they deserve, with dignity and respect. And for me, that's not only a debate about social security, but this is an opportunity for us in Scotland to finally take the reins and do things how we want to do them. For the first time in our parliament's history, we have the power to make new decisions, implement new procedures, and above all, really put people at the heart of all of this. This is indeed a significant moment for Scotland and arguably the biggest thing to happen here since devolution itself. And this bill gives our government and this parliament the opportunity to make different choices, to show the nation and the rest of the world what we're made of and what we're all about. But above all, it shows that we can create a fairer and more just society when, it take, when we take matters into our own hands. Following the devolution of 11 social security benefits in the Scotland Act in 2016, this was the first time we as parliamentarians here have had the power to really make changes to the welfare system and demonstrate our strong desire to do things differently. To put respect and dignity at the top of the agenda and make sure the system does not actually make life harder for our constituents and the people of Scotland. But by enshrining respect, uh, as the two, respect and dignity as the two unwavering pillars of our policy, we're taking a, de a definitive step uh, away from the approach that has currently been taken by the UK government. And while the UK welfare cuts continue to cause misery, push people into further poverty, poverty and attract international criticism, for the first time in UK history, Scotland has shown the way forward in implementing a system based on a statutory principle that social security is a fundamental human right. This new Scottish social security system the Scottish Government are proposing is taking a big leap forward and paving the way for devolution of powers of non-income related disability benefits, including disability living allowance and personal independence payments. And the Scottish Government has grasped this opportunity, presiding officer, despite unfortunately hearing stories of mistreatment at cold, uncaring assessments and interviews and appeal hearings on a regular basis. I'm often left shocked by those with disabilities who come to my constituency office and tell me this, but they're left feeling alone, anxious and frankly abandoned. But I'd like to use an example, and I mentioned it earlier on, this week is MS Awareness Week, and MS, multiple sclerosis, is 
Stacey has multiple sclerosis. And one of the things that you, when you look at this is a very example of a community of people who have actually had difficulty with the system. You, you don't need to look any further than people with multiple sclerosis because, as we have often said with previous systems, they have had a case of, yes, they could walk 10, 12, 20 yards one day or metres one day, but they'll be in their bed for the rest of the time. But it's more severe than that. Most people with multiple sclerosis are actually diagnosed between the ages of 20 and 40 years of age. And these are key working years. And these, nine times out of 10, they end up in a situation where they're getting benefits. And uh, recently, well, a couple of years ago, MS Society Scotland did a MS Enough campaign where they did a a survey of uh, people in uh, the society and people on benefits. They found the vast majority of their members who had MS were on benefits. And uh, if there was any change to the system or any change to their benefits, they would actually th start talking about not buying food, not paying for electricity. So when we're looking at all these policy decisions and everything we can do, I'm talking about people with real issues and problems like that. And we have to say that we are dealing with dignity and respect. We are looking after our people in a way that is actually backing that up. And I could uh, stand up here, presiding off some account, many constituents uh, damning, damaging experience at such assessments. But as you all know, I'm always about the positive things in life. And I'm always looking to the future. And under our new system, people will have the right to a supporter at every stage. And an independent advocacy service will provide for those who need them. When eligible, people will also be able to receive short-term assistance during an appeal so there's no financial barriers to prevent Scots from taking further action. Additionally, in order to cut down the number of constituents left confused, frustrated and distressed by their assessment interviews, assessments will only be undertaken when absolutely needed. And I think that, for one, is a key. Yes, I will. <laughs> Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A bit strange intervening on the person right next to you. I just wonder when we're talking about positive things, obviously the recruitment of so many people to the experience panels and the input that they had was really a concrete way of showing that we're putting dignity and respect at the heart of things because we listened to people who were directly impacted. Would you agree with me, George Adam? Well, George unsur Adam. unsurprisingly, and after the years I've worked with you, Ms McGuire, I do agree with you most of the time. And I've, I've learned that's a wise <laughs> way to be. But the, the, the whole point is, uh, Ruth McGuire is correct. You know, that has been the reason, that's been the foundation of this whole process. And yes, has it been difficult for the minister and her team? Probably it has been. But at the end of the day, I think it shows in what the, we've actually ended up with here now at the moment. So in closing, uh, presiding officer, I would actually say that this bill tells us that this, this Scottish government want to hear from people. They want to hear from them. They want to hear their story. They want to do all they can to make the types of processes when they're going through social security at these very difficult times easier. And that is what the, this really means. That is what val, uh, dignity and respect means. And it's a case of, as I said, right from the very start, presiding officer, this is a case of putting people at the very, process, the very heart of the process. And for me, People are the reason why I got involved in politics and the reason why I continue to do the work I do. So I think we've got a government here. We are showing the way forward. And I, I commend the minister once again and our team on some fantastic work. I now call Sandra White to be followed by Ben McPherson. Two to three minutes each, please. Do you have your card in? Oh, I, you, I do. you do now, <laughs> Ms. White. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to get two minutes or whatever at this, uh, I think, historic moment. It's one of the finest moments this Parliament, I believe, has ever had. Uh, and I'm so delighted that I was part of that at the beginning. And I must say, <clears throat> I want to thank everyone in the committee uh, who went forward with this, the minister, and as has been said before as well, all of the clerks and Jeanette and everyone and Simon who worked so uh, hard on this. Uh, one of the reasons that I think people you know, are emotional about this particular uh, bill going through. Yes, it is the largest bill, but it means so much to so many people. Having been out and about, as everyone here has, in constituency office as well, <clears throat> dealing with people who have went round and round endless assessments, knowing that their illness is never going to go away. For me, one of the proudest things we've done is, uh, well, two of the proudest things in this bill is no private contractors 
to look at that because it was an absolute horrendous, horrendous system. I think we should be very proud of that and the endless assessments, which people are so worried and were so worried about. But basically, if you turned up and you looked well dressed, they were telling you you felt fine. And the fact that we're looking at mental health as well in that field, I think it's something that we should be absolutely proud of. And once again, I think there's something that this Parliament, whilst the difficulties at the beginning, and I think we all admit that, I think they all worked very, very hard, all parties, to bring this forward. And I'm immensely proud that, as an MSP uh, in this Parliament, that we managed to pass this fantastic legislation. Thank you very much, President Officer. Before we move to the closing speeches, Ben McPherson. Thank you very much, President Officer. I'm very grateful for the chance to add to this debate. I, like others, I feel a great deal of, of pride today, a great deal of pride to have been a member of the Social Security Committee, to have worked with the clerks who've helped us so much, to have worked with the Bill team, to have worked with members across the different parties, and most of all, to have worked with Jean Freeman as the Minister and her stewardship uh, through this process has been absolutely remarkable and outstanding. I'd also like to thank all the third sector organisations who've been involved, both those in my constituency and those who uh, make a national impact. I'm proud because I know that this bill will enable this parliament to make an even bigger difference. It will enable us to increase the CARES allowance. That will make a difference. It will enable us to introduce a young carer grant. That will make a difference. It will enable us to create a best start scheme for many children and families. That will make a difference. It will provide the right to advocacy when required. That will make a difference. It will fast track payments for sufferers of terminal illness. That will make a difference. It will ban private sector medical assessments. That will make a difference. It will promote the take up of benefits. That will make a difference. It will uprate carers assistance, disability assistance, employment injury assistance and funeral assistance. And most of all, and crucially, in terms of the ethos of this new system, it will deliver social security as a human right based on the principles of dignity and respect. That's all something to be very proud of. All of this process is to be very proud of. And I think it demonstrates that when this parliament is given more powers and works together, whether it's yellow, blue, red, green, gold, or whatever, when we work together for a positive change, we do make a substantial difference. And by creating this public service for Scotland, we will take Scotland forward in a very remarkable and important way. And I commend all involved for that because it's a really moving and important day in Scotland's political history. Uh, we now move to the closing speeches and I call Mark Griffin. You can have up to six minutes, please, Mr. Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Um, as well as um, my thanks from um, my opening speech, I would I'd also like to, to put on record my thanks to the British Sign Language interpreters who are at the back of the chamber and have been interpreting all day. <laughs> I think well, we've shared the, the burden of speaking amongst, across the whole chamber. There's far fewer um, interpreting than I, I can only imagine how tired uh, they're feeling. But uh, it's a fantastic advert um, in light of the, some of the changes that we've seen around the accessibility uh, changes that, uh, again, Parliament has shown in the best, most accessible light. So thank you very much to the interpreters today. Um, in, in my opening speech, I welcomed the work that we have done. And while I raised some concerns, I, I did it with the 1.4 million people who will use the system in mind. Um, after all, at decision time, Scots law will confirm that social security is an investment in the people of Scotland. Um, and while it has been a long day for some of us, it's a, a far bigger day far bigger day for the people of Scotland. And when you look at some of the protections now included in the bill, mm -hmm. it's clear that we've set a path to a better social security system. The ban on the private sector uh, delivering assessments, a new right to independent advocacy for disabled people applying for their disability assistance, and protections against means testing of winter fuel, fuel payments move us beyond what exists under the UK system. And two, area, two of the areas I'm particularly proud of um, are the improvements that we have agreed today on split payments and uprating the carer's supplement in 2019. Um, I'm delighted that the Parliament accepted um, those arguments and discussions 
um, that have been ongoing for, for months um, about placing a policy commitment for automatic split payments in the bill. Yet the single payment of universal credit is undermining women's safety and reducing their financial autonomy. Yet plainly, the EHRC say universal credit has caused a drastic shift in income from women to men and fundamentally is perpetuating gender inequality. Universal credit is systematically diverting money from women, taking funds away from raising children. And that, the impact is that children are less likely to go to school, having had the, the breakfast they need, the warm coat that protects them from the elements, and what we know and understand to be the evidence of, of poverty. And, and worse still for the women who are suffering at the hands of men, nine out of 10 of them are likely to be suffering financial abuse too. And single payments can only compound that experience. So, President Officer, that's why I'm glad that we have to um, change course on split payments. And yes, clearly we have set the, the government a challenge, but they've accepted it because there are real people, women, children, and some men who will ultimately uh, benefit. Similarly, the agreement to afford carers protection from the benefit freeze is important and builds on the amendments agreed at stage two. And then I argued that carers should get up rating guaranteed as they do under the current system. And on paper, we've ensured that our joint commitment to the level of GSA is protected as inflation erodes that commitment next year. And in reality, we have, pr we have protected carers from the um, erosion of a, a benefit which would have been at a cost to them in one year of five million pounds. Now we, we, we should look to forward to improving carers' allowance more generally. That includes changing studying restrictions, the earning thresholds, and the package of support that is passported um, to the allowance. And I think our biggest job will be to support and scrutinize the government's plans for disability benefits. Um, we are ready for that challenge, um, though I hope, as many will be watching today, that we move far away from PIP, um, and so long as it's done in a manner that is fair and supportive. In this decade, disabled people have experienced that brutal transfer to PIP, and we can't repeat that, and protections should be afforded to them, just in the same way that income supplement should, I think, avoid a reliance on universal credit. President officer, the overriding message from stage three is that we as a parliament eh, must be ready ourselves for much more work here to get this right. Now, we, in this bench, we in these benches support the bill and are ready for that challenge ahead. Thank you. I call Jeremy Balfour around five minutes, please, Mr Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I start, as others have started, uh, by thanking uh, the many people who have helped us get to where we are today, to uh, the clerks of the committee, to the legislative team, to SPICE, uh, to uh, my own staff within the Conservative group that have helped us all in helping us get to, I think, uh, a bill that we can be uh, proud of and a bill that will take things forward. Can I also uh, thank the Minister for all the work that she and her team uh, behind the scenes have put in. Um, she has been open to suggestions, uh, to meetings, to telephone conversations, and even to sending emails in the early hours of the morning. And for all those things, I think we can be grateful for as a parliament. And as I think someone else said, the uh, First Minister made a very good choice in appointing you to put this through this legislation. Can I also thank... Can I also thank the third sector for their work that they have done over not just the last few weeks, but over the last year or so. Uh, both here locally, um, charities coming to talk to me, but also the national charities as well. Uh, we have not always agreed, and that has been come clear today, but uh, what they have done is given us the information, they've given us the questions to ask, and I think they too can be proud of what they have achieved collectively in bringing through this bill. I think there are some things within this bill, and hopefully that will become an act uh, soon, that we can be proud of. I think setting up a, a new commission, independent commission, 
is a massive step forward and something that uh, we can be proud of in that it will help us scrutinise and will give us independent advice, which sometimes this parliament needs um, with the pressure that we are on. I think having advice and representation in the bill is a massive step forward. I think in having the right to advocacy where it is required will open up the system to many people. And I do think we can all generally be proud of what we have done around terminal illness, a, a horrible diagnosis. But hopefully, when the new guidance comes out, we'll give people the uh, help that they need at that most difficult time. But can I, can I move on? Because, as I said earlier this afternoon, this is just the start or halfway through the journey. Can I ask the Minister, is she still committed to making sure that all these benefits will be up and running before the next election? If she is, and if the government is, will they give us some kind of outline as to when the different regulations for the different benefits will come out and, and what stages they will happen? I am, generally am, an optimist in life. And I think the Minister must be an optimist as well because she has raised a very high barrier in regard to delivery of what we are going to do. There are going to be challenges around culture, around delivery, around what is going to happen. And I, I just think we have to be careful in the language that we use that we do not overpromise. Now, I don't want to be pessimistic here, and I think we can have a system that can be different and can be good and can help over a million people in Scotland. But I think sometimes all of us just have to be careful what we promise and how we're going to promise it. Regulations are going to be the key. I can come back to my hobby horse, uh, much to Alison Johnson's annoyance of how far can you walk before you will get a benefit. These are going to be the key questions. Can I be the first one minister to lobby you on behalf of those with epilepsy who I think do face real struggles under the present PIP regulations and we need to look at how we can help people with that condition. But I think ultimately Polly McNeill is right in what she said. Uh, my assistant confessed to me last week that she went to bed dreaming of super affirmative legislation. <laughs> That cannot be a good place to be. <laughs> but I think there is now a responsibility, not just on Scottish Government, not just on the Social Security Committee, but on all MSPs to make sure that the scrutiny around these regulations that will come forward are fit for purpose, that will help our constituents, as George Adams has spoken about. Because we can have the best framework, we can have the best motivation, we can have the best charter, but unless the money is delivered into someone's bank account on the right day, with the right amount, with the right award being given, then we will have failed as a parliament and we will have failed the people of Scotland. So let us be glad today. Let us congratulate ourselves. Let us even have a weekend off. But on Monday morning, let's get down to regulations and let's see that we get them right and we, then we can be proud of what we deliver in the future. Thank you. I call Jane Freeman to conclude the debate. Can you take us up to around 10 past seven, please, Ms Freeman? Thank you, Presiding Officer. In closing, can I say that I think we've had a debate that is fitting for what is an important moment in the history of this Parliament, fitting in its tone, in its content, and even in its last-minute lobbying, Mr Balfour. And I can assure you, let me take this opportunity to assure you that when we look at those regulations, the particular issue you are raising... Uh, which affects those with epilepsy, we will take account of that and we will uh, look at all of those matters. I am also very grateful, Presiding Officer, for all the very kind comments that have been made uh, about me. But can I just be clear? I'm very grateful for those. But behind every minister, of course, is a most excellent team. And I have precisely that team across the Social Security Directorate, in my private office, and of course, with a very special, special advisor. And I am very grateful to all of them. 
In the Social Security Bill, the Social Security Scotland Bill was introduced last June following a detailed consultation and engagement process. Today marks the end of that parliamentary progression. In the 309 days since, the Bill has been significantly improved and made stronger through discussion, debate and engagement with stakeholders, with experts across the country and with MSPs from all parties and on the Parliament's Security Committee. But Mr Tompkins is right, as others have said, there is indeed much more work for us to do. Today is a special moment, of course it is, but we now have to go on and fill in the detail that makes up the flesh, if you like, around that framework. And the assurance I give to Mr Tompkins and to other colleagues in this Parliament is that we will approach that in exactly the way we have approached all of this until now. Looking for consensus, looking for ideas, working in collaboration, but above all, putting the people of Scotland first. For some, this may feel like the end of the process, but it's the start of what matters for the people of Scotland. The delivery of 11 benefits affecting, as Claire Adamson said, 1.4 million benefits that will be devolved and benefits that can be transformed. We will start later this year by investing over £30 million with a 13% increase through our Carers Allowance Supplement to take it to the same level as Job Seekers Allowance and benefiting over 70,000 carers. Then, only a few months later, in 2019, we will introduce the new Young Carer Grant, a £300 annual payment for young adults with significant caring responsibilities who do not qualify currently for carers' allowance because perhaps they are in full-time education. And in 2019, we will start delivery of the Best Start grant delivered to low-income parents across Scotland. This is a significant investment in children and families and a major improvement on the current UK provision. A one-off grant of £600 of the birth of the first child in a low-income family and two further payments of £250 in the early years of a child's life. And we don't do caps on our future generations. So we will reintroduce the grant of £300 plus two payments of £250 for the second and all subsequent children. And finally, and I'm still in 2019, we will also see the first Scottish funeral expense assistance delivered to people, helping them cope with the additional expense at time of upset and distress on the death of a loved one. We have widened the eligibility so more people who need this support can get it. We will speed up and simplify the process so people know quickly what support they will get. And from the amendment passed this afternoon, we will uprate that benefit in line with inflation. And we have already begun recruiting the first staff to deliver those benefits. And the first of our locally based staff bringing support, advice and that human face to people in their own area so they can get what they need and are entitled to more easily. When fully operational, our new agency, Social Security Scotland, will have created 1,900 jobs across Dundee, Glasgow and local communities across Scotland. A significant investment to the benefit of all of the country. So whilst the legislation is agreed, the work will continue. We will continue to learn about the ambitions people have for our new social security system in Scotland, the way they want to see it set up and to deliver. And as one of our experienced panel members, we will deliver a service that's not just a bit better, but one that is great. There is no shortage of people that we can learn from. We will continue to learn from stakeholders and the many communities with an interest in the bill, working in collaboration with them, finding out more about what works best for them and welcoming scrutiny and challenge. We will learn from the Independent Scottish Commission on Social Security, which will be established through this bill. Ministers and members of parliamentary bodies, including, of course, the Social Security Committee, will have the benefit of expert advice from the new Commission when they come to consider future proposals for Social Security in Scotland. And, <clears throat> as the recent report from Audit Scotland highlighted, we have been 
learning lessons from previous public sector programmes by delivering in phases and involving users in designing policies, processes and IT systems, following their advice and best practice to deliver a programme of imp implementation in a carefully planned and incremental way. I have taken careful note of the concerns that uh, Mr Tompkins raised, Mr Griffin has mentioned, Mr Balfour raised in uh, his last contribution. Now is not the time to be dealing in detail with those concerns. But let me say again, as I have said publicly, we are on track to deliver as we have promised in the lifetime of this parliament. What I need and what I would welcome from members across this chamber, particularly members who have colleagues in Westminster, is to help me ensure that the DWP is also on track to match the pace that we are operating to. In closing, Prem Presiding Officer, let me also thank our BSL interpreters, as Mr Griffin did. And let me especially thank all of those who have given up their time to be with us today in the gallery or watching at home. I'm very grateful for their support, for their experience and their ideas. Everything we do in this parliament as legislators and as parliamentarians is important. But today I think we've achieved something that is not only important, it is also a bit special. Special in its content, special in how we have worked together here and across the country, and special in its import for the people across Scotland we are here to represent. Because at its core, this is about people. This is about how this parliament and this government respects the citizens of Scotland and acts to demonstrate that respect in all that we do. Legislation to deliver a rights-based social security system for Scotland with dignity, fairness and respect at its heart. A new public service we can be proud of, one that will meet the needs and the ambitions of the people of Scotland and one that we will now go on to make a reality. Thank you. Thank you. And before we come to decision time, we have consideration of three business motions. Motion 11834, setting out a business programme. Motions 11835 and 11836 on timetables for two bills. If anyone wishes to speak against them, press their button now. And I call on Joe Patrick to move the above three motions. Moved together. Thank you very much. No one is asked to speak against the motions. The question, therefore, is that motions 11834, 11835 and 11836 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 11837 on approval of an SSI. And again, can I ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move the motion? Moved. Thank you very much. Now, as we uh, turn to decision time and we're voting on a bill, we'll uh, go straight to a division. And the question is that Motion 11802 in the name of Jean Freeman on Stage 3 of the Social Security Scotland Bill be agreed. Members should cast their votes now. And the result of the vote on motion 11802 in the name of Jean Freeman is yes, 119, and that is unanimous. And the motion is therefore agreed. The Social Security Scotland Bill is passed. Thank you. And there's a final question. That motion 11837 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.